Hi, my name is Emily, and um, I just wanted to talk a little bit. I was thinking, and sometimes when I get inspired, I like to share my thoughts and ideas. Um, one thing, one thing that I always tried to live by, which was uh, taught by my parents when I was growing up was to never give up on yourself and to always have trust in things that are most important to you, family, uh, friendships, uh, interests, like things you like to do. Uh, in my case, I love to write. Writing has been a very, uh, it has been a source of inspiration and it's helped me get through some difficult times and deal with things on a different level because growing up, I never had a real release to uh, channel my energies into. Um, I know part of the reason was because I was kind of struggling as a kid, uh, not feeling right. I've said it many times, you know by now, about my gender identity. I think that could have contributed to my uh, lacking of self-confidence because I wasn't able to connect socially with people. And as, well, I'd like to think of myself as being bright, but I, in actuality, I was an average student. You know, I, I wasn't capable of going to, uh, you know, the upper echelon of schools. Not that I really thought about that. But when I went to high school, I went to a pretty good high school, academically, uh, public high school, John F. Kennedy in Belmore. Um, and uh, I did pretty good in school. I was a good student, and I was also an athlete, so I think that was a good balance or mix. And I learned a lot from my experiences, not solely based on book study, but also uh, about believing in yourself and uh, putting trust in others. Uh, I think a big part of those uh, things I learned that were constructive for me specifically was running uh, cross country and track because it allowed me to make friends on the team with my teammates. My coach was very um, good at motivating us and he believed in me too, which uh, helped me believe in myself. I ran cross country. Uh, I was an inexperienced runner and I couldn't compete with the varsity team members, they were on a whole different plateau. But I was, you know, I was running my heart out, uh, even though I was only a junior varsity athlete. But to coach, that never mattered. Coach was more concerned about your individual efforts whether you were on varsity or junior varsity, it didn't matter to him. What mattered to him was teaching discipline, uh, self-confidence, uh, all the things that I wanted to have growing up. Uh, so he was very instrumental in helping me and getting me through some difficult times in my uh, situation at home with family um, and he really was
was a good influence on me. And to this day, I have some limited contact with him and also limited contact with some of my former teammates um, through uh, social media. And uh, I like to uh, think back to happy times in my life. And I think that uh, school was... Uh, it was good for me, even though I wasn't really outgoing and I didn't participate a lot in school. But I, I did, you know, I carried on and tried to do my best. And I made some good friends in high school, even though I was quite shy. I think I did okay. You know, I, I obviously wasn't good enough to go to uh, like uh, NYU, Columbia University, Cooper Union, um, the College of Actuarial Science, uh, Princeton, Yale, MIT, Harvard, Boston University, uh, and if you want to get funny, Cambridge University, Oxford University. Yeah, I'm just joking around. I knew I would never get into those kind of schools. Um, I try to understand how some people find school more easier than others. You know, and I, I look to my experiences with school and knowing that I wasn't tops in school. I mean, I went to a high school where some of the graduates went to MIT, Harvard University, um, Yale, Columbia, uh, Boston College, Boston University, University of North Carolina, University of South Carolina, um, Berkeley, uh, UCLA, uh, uh, Binghamton, Albany, uh, Potts, uh, uh, Clarkson College, you name it. You know, they went to great schools. I started out, and I'm not knocking it. But I started out at a two-year college, Nassau Community. And a lot of my former high school uh, classmates also went to Nassau. Not everybody went to Harvard. Um, and I've heard very successful stories with graduates at Nassau Community College. In fact, one of my friends, when he graduated from Nassau, uh, he was an engineering major like I was. Uh, he went on to MIT. I mean, when he was in NASA, he was like a 4.0 graduate. I uh, graduated with a 4.0 GPA for his two years at NASA. Um, and he was in the engineering club, and he was a tutor. In fact, I uh, used him as a tutor for my physics class. And I wound up getting a B, so I was pretty happy with the results. I was good in calculus. I was okay in chemistry. And uh, I moved on and went to Virginia Tech. And there's a whole story behind why I went there. But uh, I went there to study engineering, mechanical engineering. And... Uh, the first year I did so-so, you know, I could barely uh, get a C average, which I wasn't used to because when I was at NASA, I was a B, B plus student. So obviously going to a much more uh, well-known school for engineering, it was hard for me to adjust so quickly and also to take uh, upper level courses. 
And I tried my best. I was at the library all the time. <coughs> I was studying. <coughs> and I was uh, dedicated and devoted to my lab assignments and my uh, homeworks in like, uh, 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 what kind of physics did I take? Um, I took a very technical physics course. I also took uh, differential equations. I took uh, engineering economics. I took thermodynamics. I took uh, uh, principles of circuitry. Uh, uh, modern physics or something to that effect. Uh, and actually that physics class was where I got the higher grade. Of all my grades, which were predominantly C's, in the physics class I got a B plus. And I owe it to my tutor back in Nassau because he was very instrumental in teaching me to understand the concepts of physics. So when I went to Virginia Tech, I brought that uh, um, the way he taught me was instrumental in me having success at Virginia Tech with the uh, physics class. Um, I also took a course in statics and dynamics, which I got a C in. Uh, thermodynamics, I got a C plus. Engineering economics, I got a B. Um, but the video is not about grades or... Uh, I'm just trying to emphasize a point that when you're in college, you may not start off in the right course of study and you may wind up sidetracked and going into a completely different field. And I really wanted to stick it out with the engineering, but unfortunately, I think a lot of personal matters got in the way. You know, my mom being sick so much and me being far, far away from home and getting, uh, um, you know, not feeling completely comfortable living in an apartment with three other guys and uh, studying my ass off and only getting C's, basically. And I felt that if I was getting C's, I didn't think I could make it in the engineering field. You know, I would have had to pull off a major miracle to get my GPA up to at least a B. And I was also, you know, in the thick of those... Uh, junior and senior level courses, which are far different from freshman and sophomore classes. Plus, when I was in NASA, I was more intimate learning. You know, I, 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 most we had like 30 students per class, but in Virginia Tech, we were, had a lot of classes in lecture halls, and it was not the best experience for me because I was a very shy person and uh, I kind of got lost being in such a crowded classroom setting. I was intimidated. Uh, I wasn't used to that. And also I was like uh, eight hours away from home and I was pretty well isolated, you know? I was like, uh, I had a hard time talking to people. I didn't get to uh, find a uh, tutor like I did in Nassau. And, uh, you know, I made friends with an engineering student who lived near uh, Stony Brook. So we would get a ride home. Problem was I felt bad because I couldn't share the driving because I didn't drive a manual uh, transmission car. So um, 
I felt kind of guilty about that. And I didn't feel comfortable starting to learn that. So, so I liked Virginia Tech. It was a good school. But I, you know, I, I spoke to my parents about the, the situation and they uh, said maybe I should come home and uh, rethink what I want to study. And uh, I came home, I worked, uh, I was out of school for a year and I applied to uh, Stony Brook. I was contemplating continuing with my engineering. I I uh, applied to Stony Brook for their uh, mechanical engineering department. And I also applied to uh, uh, Clarkson College upstate. And I applied to Hofstra, three schools. Oh, and also SUNY Oswego. Um, I even went to an orientation up there because I was thinking of studying accounting up at uh, Stony Brook. I mean, no, accounting up in Oswego. At Stony Brook, I said mechanical engineering and uh, Hofstra University accounting and... Uh, I got accepted to Stony Brook, provided I could maintain a, a, a B GPA, but I did get accepted there. I also got accepted at SUNY Oswego because I got a tour of the campus, and I even met my uh, uh, roommate-to-be, uh, and... Uh, I also got accepted into Hofstra. I was hoping to go to Stony Brook because it was part of the SUNY system or Oswego. But going to Stony Brook, it was quite a haul to get there from home. And I figured that I couldn't stay late studying at the library because I had to be home at a reasonable hour so I could eat dinner and then study. Otherwise, I'd be at the library at Stony Brook, probably like I was at Virginia Tech. So I uh, was thinking of SUNY Oswego since it was part of the SUNY system and a lot cheaper than... Uh, uh, Hofstra, which is a private school. Um, so, after a year hiatus from college, I uh, I even lost deposit monies, like at SUNY Oswego for apartment. I had to put down uh, an amount, and I also had to... Um, uh, pay uh, for, uh, I guess, when you go to a school to consider that you're going there, you had to pay a, an amount, like as a commitment to going to the school. So I think we paid like uh, 250 or something, I don't remember. And then at Hofstra, when I got accepted, it was very local to where I lived, and uh, I could even ride a bicycle to the school from my house, which I did on occasion. And I studied accounting. I even took some summer classes like in uh, intermediate accounting and uh, computers. The only problem is when you take a summer class, it's kind of condensed. And uh, I wasn't sure if I was learning all of what I w would normally have learned in a traditional semester course. So, similar to Nassau, I ran a B average at uh, Hofstra. 
roughly like a 3.1 and Nassau I graduated with a 3.2 so it was fairly consistent certainly better than my C average down in Virginia so uh, after graduation I uh, started interviewing at uh, CPA firms not the big at that time the big eight which then became the big six and now I don't even know what they're called the big three I have no idea um, when I started working there still was the CPA from Laventhal and Horwath which obviously uh, they got into some accounting thing that was kind of fraudulent related and last I heard, they just went under or another firm bought them out or something. Because I knew a couple of the auditors at Laventhal and all that, so I never found out really what happened to them. Um, then there was like Arthur Anderson, Pete Morick and Mitchell, Arthur Young, uh, Price Waterhouse, I think Price Waterhouse does the uh, Academy Awards. And I think there was one year, I don't know if it was Price Waterhouse, but one of those big firms goofed up at the Oscars by giving the wrong uh, movie for winning. So they, they severed relationships. Uh, but I, I found Hofstra a good school, and then, like I said, I was working for a small CPA firm, and uh, I uh, had my first tax season, basically, which was interesting. Mostly I did proofreading of financial statements, and I did some uh, tax returns, um, and I worked for like three or four CPA firms over time. And I remember one of the clients that I did a tax return for was the uh, classical musician Vladimir Horowitz. If you Google his name, you'll see how accomplished he was as a, a musician. So I never got to meet uh, him. But I talked over the phone with one of his representatives. That was my first brush with fame, doing uh, Vladimir, Horowitz, Vladimir Horowitz's tax return. Um, when I was working for that same firm, I used to go up to a client uptown, and I happened to run into... Tony Roberts a couple of times. He lived around that area. Tony Roberts was, is or was an actor, and he did a lot of Woody Allen movies. And uh, I recognized him, and I, I said, um, I love your work. And he said, oh, that's nice. Uh, and he, he said thank you. I didn't ask him for an autograph or anything. I think he was kind of wanting to be under the radar, low profile. And then also when I was working for another CPA firm, I met uh, Jessica Lang. Because I used to go to a client in the city, photography, black and white, uh, and... Jessica Lang lived in the city, and she used to go there regularly. So when I was happening, when I was happened to be at the office doing their uh, books and uh, QuickBooks, working with QuickBooks, reconciling the bank accounts, going through all the accounts, making sure they were tied into all the necessary documentation I was supposed to review, I would uh, see her from time to time. I never spoke to her, but I knew who she was, and I even talked to the client, and she, the client said they've been, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, she'd been with the client 
for roughly 10 years. So, um, if you know uh, Jessica Lange, I think she was in a movie uh, with Whoopi Goldberg. I think it was called Soap Dish or Soap. I don't remember. Um, but she was in a lot of movies. I just can't think of them off the top of my uh, head. So I found it kind of interesting. You know, and, and then I bounced around. I went into private accounting. One of my first jobs in private accounting was at Bantam Books, later known as Bantam Doubleday Dow. And one of the uh, publicists... Uh, at that firm, at that company, I never met, but she was working at the same time I was, was uh, Jackie Kennedy Onassis. And I had hoped that one day I could run into her or meet her, but no, that wasn't going to happen. But I was intrigued by that knowing that she was working at the same company I was, in a different capacity, obviously. If I had it all to do over again and I was in college again, I probably wouldn't do what I studied. If I had it all to do over again, given my love of writing and creating videos, I probably would have studied... Uh, Journalism and media communications, because I love to write. I love to speak into my uh, camera, uh, creating uh, videos. And I think if push came to shove, I would have overcome my shyness. Um, and I would have probably wanted to maintain uh, some form of work where I could write. Uh, I don't think I would be so uh, quick to jump into a position where I had to uh, sit in front of a camera and give news and all that. But there are so many roles in uh, journalism and uh, media communications. Uh, I often wonder if I went into a field like that, if it would be conducive to my transitioning from male to female. Because in the accounting field, it was pretty much a no-go because of the conservatism of uh, the accounting profession. Very conservative. They don't really... Uh, go for uh, people transitioning on the job. So, yeah, if I had it to do all over again, I would have studied journalism. Um, the thing that really frustrates me is seeing my son having difficulty socially and I can relate because when I was growing up, I also had difficulties socializing with people. You know, I, I wasn't comfortable around people. And uh, I kind of withdrawn. The only time I really got involved in some form of conversation was with my coach, my teachers, and my teammates. And some friends over time that I became... Uh, uh, where we would do things like play baseball, go bowling, go to movies. Um, those were good friends, even though they were few and far between. Um, and then I lost a friend who I was very upset about. And I did a tribute video for him recently. Uh, Scott, uh, sadly he died in a car accident. So, with regard to my son, he's on the autistic spectrum. And uh, 
he has a hard time with social uh, activity. You know, even today, he's 20 now. And it pains me to see him struggling. And, you know, it's been discussed many times about placing him in a group home. And I agree with that. It's just not so easy as people think it is. It really isn't that easy because the first thing is uh, because Matthew's uh, insisting that he doesn't want to go, and this is probably based on his experience at a residential school where he went for three weeks. I mean, three weeks, no, three years. He went to camp for three weeks, but not to uh, the residential school, which was also eight hours away by car. Uh, he always says that he was not able to really learn. You know, he was lacking in a lot of areas. Uh, if he was mainstreamed in a school in Long Island within the Levittown School District, he might have done better. The problem was his behavior. And then uh, they could not rein him in. So, uh, you know, after him being uh, suspended from school, not because he's a bad kid or anything, was mostly to do with his behavior. And uh, they decided that the best place for him was upstate. And we really didn't know what to make of it. You know, we spoke to all of the uh, teachers, staff, between Levittown and Hillside upstate. And we had conference calls, and I would always be at the meetings regarding his IEP objectives and goals, and my wife as well on occasion, not always. But he was uh, not happy upstate. Uh, he didn't even accept the fact that he graduated. So he's into this thing belief that if he goes to Levittown and has a graduation there that uh, he'll be able to go forward in his uh, studies. But I have his therapist tell him that that's not possible because when I tell him that he says, no, you don't care about me. And if you did, you would get me back into Levittown schools. And so this is a very bad dilemma, and I don't really know how to resolve it. <coughs> All I know is he's now 20, and he's not showing... Uh, He's not mature enough right now based on his uh, lack of social skills. I mean, I was very shy and awkward when I went to college, and I'm not trying to compare, but I managed to get through it. I was able to study. I mean, I had some setbacks and some obstacles along the way, but I did manage to complete my studies I wasn't a genius by any means. You know, I going for a master's degree was a pie in the sky, I uh, wish. And if I went for a master's, what would I study? Accounting? No, because as long as I passed the CPA exam, which I did, um, I really didn't think I needed to get a master's. You know, um, and I took a course to help me get through the uh, CPA exam. I also had a friend from high school who was very smart, and he went to Binghamton, 
and he was a math major. But his main focus was actuarial science, uh, where he had to take uh, lots of math courses, statistics, probability. You know, he even took the really sophisticated math courses that was very theoretically based. I think one was topology. Math courses that I never touched. Uh, uh, he took uh, um, operations research. That was one of my engineering classes, in fact. And uh, before he even graduated Binghamton, he uh, had passed already four of the actuarial exams. And uh, that is quite an accomplishment because it's kind of unheard of that someone in college would have passed so many exams. Um, on occasion, there's like some students who maybe get uh, passing grades on two actuarial exams, but to do it on four was very... Uh, rare occurrence, but he was brilliant, and he graduated a year before I did, and he had, after a year of working at Metropolitan Life, where he also interned, and his whole career is at Metropolitan Life, he's still working, and he's working there, um, I'm telling you, he really tapped into the mother load because he he's a multi-millionaire no doubt uh, he's married but no children uh, and uh, last I knew he got a bonus many years ago which allowed him to buy a car cash so obviously he got a sizable bonus. Last I heard, he was making two million dollars a year, salary-wise. I was lucky that I made about a hundred thousand in my lifetime a year, but two and a half million dollars a year, and you multiply that by. 20 years, maybe 25. You're talking about uh, maybe close to $50 million. He doesn't have anything to worry about in his retirement. But what I'm trying to say is although I was shy and insecure and struggling with my gender, I managed to get through school, even though I bounced around a little bit. And also in, in my career, I bounced around. I never found a job where I spent more than uh, 10 years at. Um, I wish Matthew could find himself you know, the idea of him going into a group home seems to be the uh, proper thing to do. The problem also is that he doesn't want to go. And his uh, Medicaid coordinator, who no longer is working in, in that uh, agency, she moved on. So now we're working with a... Uh, a new Medicaid coordinator, but the other girl who left, her name was Courtney, and she was insistent that Matthew go into a group home. And uh, she even mentioned the fact that we might have to go to court and declare Matthew incompetent so he couldn't make his own decision uh, because he was dead set against it. 
And every time it was brought up, he would like run out of the house. He didn't want any part of it. And he kept saying, you just want to abandon me. You know, and that's tough, you know, because what do I do? I'm going to force him into a group home? I, you know, people think it's so easy, but it's really not. Um, but I am in agreement with some of my friends who tell me that that's the best thing to do for him. And I agree. But if he doesn't want to go, what am I supposed to do? Um, and to me, it's also heartbreaking because as uh, you know, any parent wants the best for their child or children. Matthew's our only child and, you know, I, I wish I could uh, help him make decisions. Um, but even if he went to Nassau, I, I don't think he would uh, be able to uh, get into the routine, maybe over time. But initially, I would like be having a breakdown just worrying about him getting to school on a bus being able to navigate the campus, go to all his classes, um, act properly in the classroom, uh, volunteer answers in the classroom, understanding the nature of his studies, um, doing his work responsibly at the library, interacting with other students, um, and being able to manage and being responsible enough to go from one class to the other and not getting lost and then being able to get on the bus and come home. But knowing my son's situation, it's not possible at this point. I, when I was going to Nassau, I was able to get there initially by bus, and then uh, in my second year, my dad used to work near the school working on a bank building, so he would uh, allow me to use his car, and I would drop him off, because he was only like uh, a couple of minutes away from Nassau community. And... Uh, I had uh, classes scheduled where I could pick my dad up at 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, and uh, I did okay. Like I said, I had a B average, basically. And it was a good starting point for me. But for Matthew, I don't know. I mean, he seems pretty knowledgeable, like, he likes computers, but, you know, if you study computers, you really have to know mathematics. Uh, and when he went to that school upstate, he only learned algebra. And they made special allowances for children on the spectrum or disabled, giving them extra time to complete their regions. Um, I believe he took the algebra regions, but he didn't take anything beyond algebra, mathematic wise, mathematically wise. Uh, he never took a chemistry class, never took a biology class. Uh, basically, mathematics wise, he only took algebra. He took uh, basic English. He didn't take any foreign language. No chemistry, no biology, uh, no real physical activities he took. Um, uh, what else? Uh, history, uh, art, music. Uh, not even computers. Um, 
And so it was not really conducive for him to go right into a college program. If he did, he'd have to take a lot of remedial classes. So normally a two-year college, like it was for me, would probably be maybe a four-year of study within a community college setting because he'd have to take so many remedial classes. They'd have to figure a way that he could get around the campus and be independent, uh, get him familiar with the bus system. And obviously, if I'm able to take him, I would drive him and... Uh, either hang out at the library or pick him up in the afternoon. Um, so I'm trying to deal with that. And I, I'll be honest with you, I'm heartbroken. You know, because I always wanted the best for my son. You know, I wanted to see him succeed and find his way into this world and do the things that makes him happy. I know working for a living is something we all need to do, um, you know, and having high expectations, sometimes you got to come down to reality and realize your limitations, and you can't shoot for the stars, even if you want to, you have to work within your means and your knowledge base. So, I don't know, I'm just rambling now at this point, but the, I don't know how I got sidetracked, but I was trying to say the most important thing in life is trying to find something that makes you happy. You know, whether it's writing, creating movies, videos, photography, math, computers, uh, the biological sciences, chemistry, uh, or going to a trade school even, uh, studying carpentry, auto mechanics, or studying to be a police officer, uh, a fireman or a firewoman now, uh, or I don't know how they distinguish, um, or a teacher, uh, you know, it takes a lot of uh, exploration, trying to figure out what you want to do. Um, if I could envision what my son may be able to do if he did, in theory, go to college. If I was trying to recommend something for him to study. I know he likes, uh, well, he's uh, he likes working on the computer. I'm trying to see what he could do with his skills. He's very sm he's very smart academically, even though he got a substandard education. But uh I really can't pin down what I would recommend him doing or studying. You know, maybe uh I mean he maintains a blog, he likes to write. Oh, and he also likes to sing. I mean, he knows the words for the whole song, basically, for Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, he knows the song American Pie. Uh, you know, he knows the Justin Bieber songs, even though he's not a fan of Justin. Uh the Beatles, he knows uh, some songs from the Beatles. He also knows lines in movies. I mean, Home Alone, he's he's imitating uh, Kevin. Uh, 
uh, Macaulay Culkin. Uh, so he, that I mean, to me, that's kind of a skill. But how do you incorporate that into doing something? Uh, because he he may be going to drama or something, acting. Uh, he likes to sing. But when my wife tried to get him into piano lessons, he really wasn't interested. And I tried to get him into soccer, uh, karate. Uh, he did play baseball for two seasons. It was geared to kids who had developmental disabilities. But they still played the game. And uh, he seemed to be good at that. Um, so I try to think about what he might be interested in, uh, but that remains to be seen. Uh, so always try to do what you want to do in life. Study hard, uh, have confidence in your abilities. Never be ashamed to ask questions. Uh, never give up. Uh, if you feel overwhelmed, maybe you have to re um, reassess what you want to do in life and come to the ter come to terms with the fact that you're going to have to make a living. You know, nothing's given to you on a silver platter. You have to earn everything that you want in life. Um, I was working for roughly 30 years before I got sick. Um, and in my early 50s, I started transitioning from male to female. Uh, and that, unfortunately, wasn't accepted uh, seven years ago. Uh, today, I guess it's becoming more commonplace. However, with this new administration, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but I'm plugging away, you know. I'm not working. I'm on disability. So I try to keep myself busy and, you know, I take Matthew out. I'm going to doctors regularly. He's going to doctors regularly. I go to a psychiatrist, a therapist, a GP, general practitioner. Uh, he also goes to a therapist and a psychiatrist. And he goes to a GP, of course. Um, and then I write. Uh, I also do videos. I have a YouTube channel. I also have a poetry website where I love to write. I have a music website. Uh, I have YouTube. And then I have all the social media. My life basically is an open book. Ever since I started my transition and realizing my son had uh, autism, it inspired me to start writing. And though I was very shy, I could do things on my own, you know, uh, like creating a video. I kind of found it cathartic, you know, like uh, it helped me. And plus, when I'm talking, even though I don't have people around me, it's my way of reaching out. You know, and it helps me. I'm creative too with videos. Like I, I do slideshow videos because when you're transgender, I don't know about others, but I like to do before and after. Not just for me, but in hopes that it may help somebody out there who's struggling with what I struggled with. You know, and uh, I just want my son to find himself. You know, if it means he's going to go into a group home, then he's going to go into a group home. 
time will tell. I also find that I'm contemplating death a lot. Because I'm getting older now, I'm 58. You know, I'm experiencing a lot of emotional pain, depression. I had a suicide attempt in January. And uh, I'm very lonely. I mean, I'm married, I love my wife, but it's not the best, uh, you know, I wish it could be better. Uh, but we stay, we need each other in a way, just like I need my son. You know, I, I couldn't want, I didn't, I couldn't, I wouldn't want to be alone, you know. That's the worst feeling. Um, you know, we all need somebody in our life. I have some friends who are nice, you know. I try to be a good friend to people, try to be a good father. Uh, I like to uh, keep my mind busy now because, you know, I had a resurgence with my writing and I'm glad I did because before I got back into the groove of writing and doing videos, I was so depressed I would just sleep the whole day away. The only time I would get up and get out of the house was if I had a doctor's appointment or Matthew did. But then, you know, uh, Matthew and I would get lunch after the appointments and then I'd come home, put the TV on and I'd go to sleep. And it was terrible. I mean, I was so depressed that I couldn't even get out of bed. I just wanted to sleep. Because if you sleep, you don't think. You don't get upset. You're just sleeping. And basically in January, I really wanted to go to sleep. Permanently. I overdosed with the intention of taking my life. I just sometimes feel overwhelmed. You know, and I've been having this hope that one day I could feel whole as a person, you know, and I always wanted the surgery to uh, help me in my feminine female identity. And it, it, it's been such a long time now with uh, three postponements and now I'm going for the fourth attempt uh, the thing holding it up is my aftercare plan because uh, I'm kind of surprised but they said recovery could be up to three months plus emotionally I'm having a lot of problems with driving nowadays I don't know why I have this on, on, uh, I have this exaggerated fear that I'm going to get into a car accident and get, uh, killed. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I lost some friends and some relatives to, uh, car accidents. And then I lost my friend from high school days in uh, an ac a car accident. And I also lost former classmates uh, that were killed in uh, car accidents. And I've seen many accidents on the road. roads. In fact, when I was dropping off a tax return for my friend in Connecticut, I was driving on the Meadowbrook Parkway and uh, I saw a car up ahead of me in the left lane and I don't usually drive in the left lane but I got boxed in. I have a hard time, I don't know if anybody else does, but I have a hard time being able to look in my right rear view mirror 
and judging if there's a car coming. I have a very bad, uh, in fact, it's fearful that I'm going to go into the right lane and there's going to be a car right near that and I'm going to get hit. It's an exaggerated fear, but it is a legitimate fear. You know, and if I'm driving with my son, I'm always asking him to look to see if there are cars coming. Because I had some close calls where I'm going into the other lane and then I hear this honking and then I get all shaken up and God forbid I hit the car. Um, so that's a big fear of mine lately. And, you know, in fact, yesterday I had to pass up going to a Met game with my son because I have this exaggerated fear of getting into a car accident. And also, I'm having weird dreams about it. You know, I read a horrible story about a rock band from uh, the UK who were performing in a European tour. And I think they were in uh, Sweden. They were doing uh, some concerts in Sweden. And the four boys in the band couldn't be more than early 20s, uh, were driving from their, uh, after they did their performance, they were driving back to their hotel. The four uh, boys or young men in the band, plus their uh, business manager, and uh, they were heading towards a bridge that they had to cross. And they realized that the bridge was, uh, it was a drawbridge, so it was coming up to let, uh, I guess, uh, ships go under. Uh, so they have to raise the roadway. And uh, they were going too fast and they couldn't uh, make it stop in time and they went and fell into the ocean and they all got killed. Uh, anyway, I, I was saying something. I was driving on the Meadowbrook and I was in the left lane, which was un is unusual for me typically because I'm always driving in the right lane. Uh, and I was approaching, I saw this car, and I thought he was stopped for traffic or something. And I was going a little faster than I may have should have been. And as soon as I saw the car, I saw him, I said, oh God, I had to stop on the dime. Otherwise I would have plowed into the car. And I was thinking, maybe I should check what's going on in this car. And I knew I couldn't leave my son alone in the back seat because of all the passing traffic. And so I was, event uh, I was thinking of, you know, getting, you know, exiting the driver's side and approaching the car to see if the guy needed help because he had his, his uh, car stationary in the left lane, which is very dangerous. So I knew I couldn't get out and leave my son alone. So I, I tried, when the traffic was clear, I, you know, peered into the window when I was getting over in the right lane and there was nobody in the car. Whoever was driving the car left it abandoned on the left lane, in the left lane. So I, I had a very close call where I could have hit that car and we could have got killed. You know, you can't just stop going like 40 or 50 miles an hour. You know, and I had to really stomp on the brakes and I was shaken up. And uh, I checked immediately to see if my son was okay. 
um, and then uh, when I saw nobody in the car and it was abandoned in the left lane, I was saying, God forbid a car crashes into that. That's going to be, it wouldn't result, uh, it may have resulted in the driver's death. So I immediately called 911 and I said, there's an abandoned car in the left lane on the Meadowbrook. Uh, you better get somebody there and get it out of that lane, otherwise you're going to have a major catastrophe uh, in, on your... You're going to have to get there as quickly as possible. And uh, I left it at that. And uh, I gave them my phone number in case they needed to reach me. But I never got a call back, so I assume they handled that situation. But I have an irrational fear of driving now. In fact, when I went to the Queen's LGBT Center, uh, my friend said, uh, you know, meet me at my house or apartment. And I said to my friend, I, I can't. I just get so anxiety stricken when they get behind the wheel of a car nowadays that I rather not drive and uh, my friend he's a good friend of mine and he said okay then I'll come and pick you up and he picked me up and then we went to the LGBT center and that's when we did the karaoke so it was fun and I felt bad, but uh, he understood. And then we went out to eat, and then he drove me home. And I said, if you need to sleep, you can sleep here. And he said, no, nah, he's fine. And then he texted me when he got home safe. And tonight, or yesterday, I mean, uh, we were going to go to the Met game, Matthew and I. And for some reason, I just didn't want to drive, you know. So I ate uh, the cost of two tickets, roughly $40. But I saved on parking because that's 25 So I ate $40. And we have a game on July 2nd, uh, Mets and Yankees. So I, I can't just do the same thing. Somehow I'm going to have to just get behind the wheel and go there. But last night, instead of going to the Met game, we went to see uh, yesterday the Beatles-themed uh, movie, which was awesome. I highly recommend it. The actors were amazing. Uh, there was... Uh, Hamesh Patel, he played Jack Malik. Lily James, who's one of my favorite actresses, she played Ellie. Uh, Kate McKinnon from Saturday Night Live. Uh, Lily played his uh, initial agent or business manager, and then Kate McKinnon came into the scene after he, his career took off. Uh, and then Ed Sheeran, the musician, also played his, himself. And uh, the premise of the movie was uh, he, uh, uh, Jack Malik, played by Himesh Patel. This was actually his debut uh, mainstream movie. And he also does, uh, he's a singer in a band, musically inclined, plus an actor. And he was phenomenal. He even sang all the Beatles songs. And the premise of the movie was that after the his first agent dropped him off, he, he had his bike in the car, in the trunk or something. And he took out the bike, put his helmet on, and he started riding home, I guess. But he didn't get there because he had a... For some reason, 
all the power throughout the whole world just went out went out for a couple of minutes or so and because there were no lighting no lighting he crashed into a bus he fell off the bike and his he bumped his head he lost some teeth and was taken to the hospital and then uh, his new his uh, first agent bought him a guitar uh, acoustic guitar and uh, they said oh, why don't you play a song of yours so he played uh, uh, one of the Beatles songs a popular song uh, and they were like in awe that he wrote this song and he said uh, they said wow that's a great song you should uh, um, you should think of making an album if you have other songs. And he said, no, that's a Beatles song uh, written by John Lennon and Paul McCartney. And they said, who are the Beatles? And he said, you're joking, right? So after they like gave him funny looks, like they never heard of the Beatles, he goes on the internet and he types in Beatles and he sees uh, an article about bugs, you know, beetles. And uh, he keeps looking and he looks up Rolling Stones. Rolling Stones exist, but no beetles. No mention of John, Paul, uh, John, Paul, George, and Ringo. He looked up beetles, then he looked up their names and nothing and he's saying what the heck is going on and uh, then he like had a board and he wrote all the titles of the Beatles songs and somehow he kind of connected all the lyrics and he started playing these songs and people were like oh my god you're like such an amazing artist and then he went out to California and they signed him to a record deal meanwhile he's playing all the Beatles songs and towards the end of the movie, he finds out about a gentleman named John Lennon. And he's like in his 70s, which we all know is impossible because of what happened to him. But uh, he actually gets to meet John Lennon as an old man with his gr uh, glasses. And he looked like John Lennon. Uh, and he didn't even have a connection to the Beatles, John Lennon, because it's like he never was a part of that. There were no Beatles. So Jack Malik is playing all the Beatles songs because he knows. But nobody else does. And uh, towards the end, he's got this mega concert, and he had just visited with John Lennon. And uh, he's playing all these Beatles songs back in the USSR. And Ed Sheeran said, they stopped calling Russia the USSR a long time ago. And he like was surprised. How did you reference USSR in the song? And then there was a funny scene where he started singing, Hey Jude. And uh, Ed Sheeran says, I think you need to change the title. And he says, it should be, hey, dude. <laughs> and he says, what? I don't think so. And he's insisting that it should be, hey, dude. So he starts saying, hey, dude. And he said, no, no, it's not that way. And he's saying, oh, no, it's, hey, Jude. And, and it's funny. And, uh. At the end of the movie, he's upset because his girlfriend, Lily James, uh, he wants to get back with her. He loves her. So he has to make this big announcement in front of the crowd uh, and says he's a, a fake. 
he didn't write these songs. He said the Beatles wrote these songs. John, Paul, George, and Ringo. And he was insistent that these were not his songs and that he should not be able to continue this charade, I guess, even though it was well-intentioned. So he said, under no circumstances am I going to take a dime for these songs. I'm going to let these songs play. We're going to upload them and you can have them for free as part of the Beatles' legacy. The Beatles. Uh, and then at the end, obviously him and Lily, or her name was... Uh, Ellie, Malik, Jack, Malik, and Ellie get together, and they get married, and at the very end, she's a school teacher, so she ha they have the class uh, uh, all together in the auditorium, and here he's playing one of the Beatles songs, and uh, he's singing it very casually, uh, and they just love it, and they give him a standing ovation. And then he sings his song, and that's received well, too. And that's how they left the movie. Uh, he never got to actually meet the Beatles. It was like they never existed. And he had nightmares. Like he was on one of the talk shows, and he said, yeah, I've been just creating this music. And the host of the show said, okay, what was the meaning behind this song or that song? Like Eleanor Rigby or Strawberry Fields. And he kind of tried to give him a reasonable uh, interpretation. And then in his dream, uh, the guest the host says, we have somebody here who wrote that music. Uh, they're called the Beatles. And then he's like, he wakes up in a sweat, but he realized it was a nightmare. It wasn't real. It was an awesome movie. It's probably one of my favorites. Uh, don't bother with, don't listen to what the critics say. What I say is it's a thumbs up. Great movie, you gotta see it. In fact, I'll probably see it again with my son again. Anyway, I guess I bounced around. I'm gonna still put it on YouTube. Uh, and then uh, I guess that's it for today. Bye. I love you guys.